wondering. It's the morning of July 8th, 2003, six days before the world will learn the truth about Valerie Plain. Six days before a newspaper column will expose her as a CIA agent and turn her life upside down. On this morning, New York Times reporter Judith Miller is making her way through a restaurant. She's a few blocks from the White House, and as she gazes across the tables, she sees her source. It's Scooter Libby, Vice President Dick Cheney's chief of staff. Libby sits with a steaming cup of coffee, waiting for her to arrive. Miller joins him at the table and pulls up a chair. Libby greets her. Morning, Judy. Thanks for coming. Of course, Scooter. You can probably imagine things have been crazy in the newsroom. But before we talk about what's on your mind, I wanted to talk to you about the Joe Wilson op-ed. Miller reports on Iraq and nuclear weapons, and she's hungry to learn more about the op-ed everyone's talking about, the article that hotly disputed the Bush administration's justification for going to war. Libby takes a sip of coffee and launches into it. Sure, let's talk about it, but first, let's get one thing straight. You can only quote me as a former Hill staffer. I need your word on that, or we stop right here. It's strange. Miller knows that Libby hasn't worked on Capitol Hill since the 90s, but he's part of the administration now. Still, she agrees to the conditions. Understood, Scooter? So? Okay, well, first of all, Wilson's article was completely inaccurate. Do you guys even check that stuff? Miller waits silently for Libby to press on. Look, Wilson went to Niger and drank tea with his old buddies. He isn't qualified to search out a uranium deal. He doesn't know the right players. God, he was an underling when he worked there for the State Department. And that was in the 70s, and the CIA knows it. The waiter brings Miller a coffee, and Libby abruptly stops talking. Miller uses the moment to catch up on her notes. This is weird, she thinks. Libby isn't usually so talkative. The waiter leaves and Libby presses on. The CIA has a classified report from last year. It says Wilson came back with information showing that in 1999, Iraq had tried to buy uranium from Niger. Libby pauses as Miller continues to scribble notes. And then he lays out another juicy detail. And I'll tell you something else. Wilson's wife is a counter-proliferation officer at the CIA. Her name's Valerie Plame. The implication is clear. This is how Wilson was selected to go to Africa. It was nepotism, plain and clear. Another damning piece of evidence against Joe Wilson. Miller and Libby talk for a couple of hours, and Miller leaves with a notebook filled with what she thinks is solid inside information. He's a good source, she thinks. She'll probably get a story on the front page. But Judith Miller will get a lot more than just a news story. When the dust settles, she'll find herself in jail, and she'll be at the center of a major controversy as the Justice Department goes on a hunt looking for the government officials who leaked the identity of Valerie Plain. American Scandal is sponsored by the new Audible original Bad Republican by Meghan McCain. In her debut audio memoir, Meghan McCain gives a first-hand look into the life of the conservative rebel and departing co-host of The View. You'll hear what it's like to grow up as the daughter of an American icon and to mourn his loss very publicly just one year into her tenure as co-host of America's most-watched daytime talk show. Her memoir also reveals how she handled attacks from the U.S. president and her thoughts on cancel culture, dating, and how our country treats new mothers. It's unsparingly honest, deeply relatable, and highly entertaining. Go beyond what you know about Meghan McCain from TV and your newsfeed. Visit audible.com slash bad Republican and listen now. We get support from the new podcast, Hemingway's Picasso. Stephen Coe lived many lives. He was an NFL journeyman, a male model, and one of the most well-connected smugglers in 1980s Miami. Coe collected many souvenirs from his adventures, but his most treasured bounty, a beautiful ceramic crafted by Pablo Picasso and gifted to Ernest Hemingway at the author's Cuban home. So the story goes. Lost during the Cuban Revolution, the artwork resurfaced when Coe took it as payment for a drug run financed by the notorious Pablo Escobar. Coe passed away in 2018, passing the piece down to his son, Stevie. Stevie feels he needs to complete his father's mission of selling this piece and telling Steve's cinematic life story. Is the Picasso authentic or a fraud? Was Steve Coe a big talker or a real deal smuggler? Listen to new episodes of Hemingway's Picasso every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In 2003, a newspaper column by Robert Novak revealed that Valerie Plame was a covert CIA operative. Senior officials in the Bush administration had revealed Plame's identity to Novak. This appeared to be payback to Joe Wilson, Plame's husband, and a critic of the war in Iraq. The leak upended Plame's life and sent a strong message to opponents of the war. It was better to stay silent than to challenge the administration. But White House officials wouldn't escape without scrutiny. Soon, federal investigations would begin looking for the sources of the leak, and a special prosecutor would take on a grave task. He would consider whether government leaders should be prosecuted as criminals. This is Episode 2, The Investigation. It's August 20th, 2003. Joe Wilson is flying into Seattle on a cloudless day. He's here because Democratic Congressman Jay Inslee has invited him to attend a town hall meeting. At the meeting, Wilson will explain how the Bush administration shaped intelligence and convinced Americans the country needed to go to war. It's a topic Wilson has been speaking publicly about, and he shows no signs that he's going to hold his tongue. Earlier that morning, he appeared on the Seattle Fox station and CNN, where he called for Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld and his senior staff to be fired for their part in ginning up the war. Wilson arrives at the high school auditorium where the meeting is scheduled to take place. It's supposed to hold 600 people, but well over 1,000 have shown up. As he and Inslee walk onto the auditorium stage, the crowd rises and gives a standing ovation. 
And as Inslee introduces Wilson, the crowd gives him another ovation. It lasts until Wilson can get on the microphone and say, Bob Novak, eat your heart out. The audience loves it. The discussion gets into how the administration pushed the country into war using false evidence, and the mood in the room grows angry. Wilson knows there are pacifists and activists out there, but there are plenty of folks who are simply concerned citizens. During the question and answer period, he fields a question about the leak of his wife's undercover CIA position. There's got to be an investigation, someone says. What does he hope to see happen? Wilson pauses a few seconds, looking at the thousand people silently waiting for his answer. He thinks about the first-hand tip he'd gotten a few weeks ago, that Carl Rove, George Bush's senior advisor, had called a journalist and said that Valerie was fair game. Wilson leans into the microphone. My intention is to fully support an investigation, he says. After all, wouldn't it be fun to see Karl Rove frog march out of the White House in handcuffs? The auditorium erupts in whistles and applause. But no matter how blistering his attacks, Wilson can't compel anyone from the administration to speak transparently about the scandal. Though the White House isn't staying quiet either. In September of 2003, Vice President Dick Cheney appears on Meet the Press and sidesteps questions about his involvement. There was a, a story in the National Journal that Cheney authorized Libby to leak confidential information. Can you confirm or deny that? I have the authority as vice president under an executive order issued by the president to classify and declassify information. And everything I've done is consistent with the, those authorities. Could you declassify Valley Plains' status as an operative? I've said all I'm going to say on the subject, Tim. The Bush administration may not admit its role in the leak, but an investigation is about to change that. It's the morning of September 28, 2003. Valerie Plain hears the Sunday edition of the Washington Post hit the front door of her home. It's always bigger on the weekend, but today the paper bears some truly heavy news. Valerie grabs her copy of the Post and joins Joe in the kitchen where he's making coffee. She opens the paper, and that's when she sees the front page headline. It reads, Bush administration is subject of inquiry. CIA agent's identity was leaked to media. She turns to Joe, incredulous that an investigation is actually happening. According to the Post, the CIA recommended that the Department of Justice investigate the leak, and that's what the Justice Department is planning to do. The article goes on. A senior administration official said that before Novak's column ran, two top White House officials called at least six Washington journalists and disclosed the identity and occupation of Wilson's wife. An administration official is quoted, clearly it was meant purely and simply for revenge. Plame shakes her head. Revenge is exactly what she and Joe suspected this whole time. A wave of relief washes over Wilson's face because the wheels of justice have just begun to turn and the story is only going to get bigger. In the coming days, the media gives relentless coverage to the controversy and the vast majority of the stories are sympathetic to Plame and Wilson. Political support for the couple is widespread and bipartisan, from staunch conservative Pat Buchanan to left-wing leader Jesse Jackson. President Bush takes a stand too. In a statement, he says, I want to know the truth. And soon, it'll begin to come out. It's early morning, October 1st, 2003, just days after the Department of Justice said it would investigate the leak of Valerie Plame's identity. Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage is at home reading the paper. He's 58 and a veteran of three combat tours in Vietnam. He's held senior positions in three administrations too. He and his boss, Secretary of State Colin Powell, are the sole moderates in the Bush regime, the cooler heads. Armitage doesn't rattle easily, but this is different. He's poring over a column by Robert Novak and he's not liking what he's reading. It reads, during a long conversation with a senior administration official, I asked why Wilson was assigned to the mission to Niger. He said Wilson had been sent by the CIA's counterproliferation section at the suggestion of one of its employees, his wife. It was an offhand revelation from this official, who is no partisan gunslinger. Armitage goes pale. A senior administration official? A long conversation? Novak is talking about him. Armitage reaches for the phone and speed dials the private number of Colin Powell. He picks up on the first ring. <laughs> Have you seen Novak's column? I'm sure he's talking about me. Powell is confused. What are you talking about? Back in July, I did an interview with Novak in my office, right after Joe Wilson's op-ed ran in the Times. He asked me why the CIA would send a guy like Wilson on a mission to find uranium. And what'd you tell him, Rich? Armitage pauses as he considers what he's about to tell his boss. I told him that Wilson's wife works at the CIA in counterproliferation and that her name is Valerie. <sighs> I swear to God, it was completely offhand. I have nothing against Wilson or his wife. I would never intentionally expose a covert officer, and I had no idea Novak would put it in his goddamn column. Powell clears his throat. <clears throat> All right. There's one thing to do. We've got to come clean. There can be no cover-up around this. I'm with you, Colin. I'm going to contact our attorney, and then we're going uh, to tell the Justice Department everything. It's a presidential mandate at this point. Understood. The two men hang up. A mandate. In a press conference just 48 hours ago, Bush made a stern promise. If there was a leak out of my administration, he said, I want to know who it is, and if the person has violated the law, the person will be taken care of. Armitage knows that with a mistake like this, his career could be over. This could be a criminal offense. So there's only one thing to do. The next day, two FBI agents and a Justice Department prosecutor show up at his office, and Armitage cooperates fully. He explains that the leak was unintentional. He feels relieved, even if his career is in jeopardy. The investigation, though, is far from over, because Richard Armitage isn't the only official who spread the leak. It's New Year's Eve 2003. Since the Justice Department investigation was announced two months ago, Valerie Plame has been wary of Attorney General John Ashcroft. Ashcroft is the man tasked with heading the inquiry, but he's got ties to Karl Rove, and Rove, she thinks, 
is probably responsible for leaking her identity. She knows the two men have a long history together. Back in the 80s and 90s, Rove was a campaign consultant for Ashcroft when he ran for governor and senator. Ashcroft had paid Rove almost $750,000 for his efforts. To claim this seems like a problem for the investigation. It's a conflict of interest. How can Ashcroft be impartial? How can he honestly investigate an old business partner? Claim is home, sipping a glass of wine and watching the news when she learns of a big announcement. Ashcroft has recused himself from the investigation. It's like a late Christmas gift and a New Year's firecracker rolled into one. Claim is giddy, lifts her wine glass and toasts the TV screen. And then the news just keeps getting better. Deputy Attorney General James Comey announces Ashcroft's replacement, Patrick Fitzgerald, the U.S. Attorney for Illinois. Flame has heard great things about the guy. In the courtroom, Fitzgerald prosecuted mafia kingpin John Gambino. He put together the first criminal indictment of Osama bin Laden. He's indicted the former governor of Illinois and top aides to Chicago Mayor Richard Daley. He's six foot two and a former rugby player who was never afraid to get bloody. He's fearless, honest, and relentless. What's more, he'll have total authority. He won't have to answer to anyone in the Justice Department or the President. It's a level of autonomy that's unheard of. She refills her wine glass. New Year's Eve, time for a fresh start. And for the first time, she feels something positive might actually come out of this mess. In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1st, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. These were secrets that once uncovered would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast Over My Dead Body is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Hey, I'm Mike Corey, the host of Wanderies Against the Odds. In our next season, I'm telling the story of a group of Chilean miners who are trapped half a mile underground when their mine collapses. At first, rescuers fear that the men were crushed to death under tons of rubble. Then, when they make contact with the miners, they must undertake a rescue operation unlike any other in mining history, one that will be watched by over one billion people around the world. This is the incredible story of how mine experts, rescue specialists, politicians, and even NASA teamed up to reunite 33 men with their families on the surface. Follow Against the Odds on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you're listening right now. It's February 25th, 2004. Robert Novak stands in the chilly morning air waiting for his ride. It's a trip he'd rather not take. He's being summoned by Special Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald to the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. Fitzgerald has convened a grand jury and is taking testimony. Though to whom exactly Fitzgerald has been talking is tightly held information. Novak's an old-school journalist who lives and dies by his sources. He feels they should be protected at all costs, even though his counsel instructs him to comply with whatever Fitzgerald wants, because if he doesn't name names, he could be found in contempt of court. Still, the grand jury proceedings are secret. No journalists are allowed, and no one will know that Novak has testified. So over the course of two hours, Novak tells all. He reveals his sources for the leak, Carl Rove, Richard Armitage, and CIA spokesman Bill Harlow, who confirmed what Novak had learned from his other sources. Novak finishes testifying and leaves the courthouse. He feels uncomfortable because he's broken a journalistic oath. He doesn't like what he's been compelled to tell the grand jury, but he is off the hook. Through the testimony of Novak and others, Patrick Fitzgerald is accumulating ammunition. He's demanding documents and emails from the White House and phone records from Air Force One. He's got three confirmed names on his list of leakers, but now his job is to determine whether anyone has broken the law and compromised national security. In fact, Fitzgerald has two laws to consider, the Intelligence Identities Protection Act and the Espionage Act. Both cover the penalties of leaking classified information, but are rarely invoked and somewhat ambiguously written. By late February, Fitzgerald is reaching into the White House for more than phone records and emails. He calls Carl Rove to testify, who admits to the conversation with Novak where he divulged Plame's CIA position. In the following month, Fitzgerald faces another White House figure, Scooter Libby, Vice President Dick Cheney's chief of staff. It's March 2004. Scooter Libby shows up to the courthouse in a dark suit. His face is expressionless, revealing nothing. Fitzgerald begins with his questions. When did Vice President Cheney initially tell you that Valerie Plame worked for the CIA in counterproliferation? This question is a bold confrontation of who's really responsible for the leak. It's the first time Libby has had to answer it, flat out. He's in the headlights, but prepared enough to fudge his answer. Uh, that would be in the middle of June of 2003, to the best of my recollection. But I'd forgotten about it until I spoke with Tim Russert on July 10th. He said, did you know that Ambassador Wilson's wife works for the CIA? All the reporters know it. Tim Russert is host of MSNBC's Meet the Press. And what was your reaction to that, Mr. Libby? Well, I was taken aback by it. And I said, no, I, I don't know that. Did you discuss Joseph Wilson's op-ed in the New York Times with Vice President Cheney? Yes, on multiple occasions. He was upset about it. He wanted to get all the facts about what Wilson had or hadn't done in terms of the Niger trip. He asked, is this normal for them to just send somebody out like this uncompensated? 
he was interested in how did this person come to be selected for the mission? At some point, his wife worked for the agency, you know. Uh, that was part of the question. Libby will go on to say that Cheney never spoke with him about the idea that Plain was behind Wilson's Niger trip. They didn't discuss the issue, Libby says, until after Novak's column ran, after the information had been revealed. But Fitzgerald is suspicious of this. He suspects that Libby is covering for Cheney. And what seems more likely is that Cheney gave Libby the green light to leak Plain's identity to get revenge on Wilson. But for now, Fitzgerald decides to wrap things up. All right, Mr. Libby, that'll be all for now. Thank you for coming. As Libby leaves the courthouse, Fitzgerald, the special prosecutor, thinks about his next plan of attack. It's Cheney. He needs to learn more about the vice president's involvement in this case. And to find answers, Fitzgerald turns to a source in the news media, Tim Russert, host of Meet the Press. NBC lodges serious objections to the questioning, but Fitzgerald prevails, and a few months later, he presses Russert for more information. Fitzgerald asks Russert about Libby's claim, that Libby learned of Plame's CIA job from Russert, but the TV host denies this completely. He says when he spoke with Libby on the phone in July of 2003, Russert didn't know anything about Valerie Plame. Fitzgerald had suspected this. He's caught Libby in a lie. Fitzgerald asks Russert when he discovered Plame's CIA identity, and Russert explains that his only knowledge of Plame came through reading Novak's column. His first thought, he says, was, wow, it was news to me. Fitzgerald wants to emphasize one point. He asks Russert about the phone call, in which Libby says they discuss Wilson and Plame. Russert says he did speak on the phone with Libby, but about another matter. After Russert leaves the courtroom, Fitzgerald looks over his notes. Russert's testimony contradicts Libby's on nearly every point. And if what Russert is saying is true, then there's only one conclusion. Vice President Cheney, second in command, has lied under oath. It's April 2004, and Valerie Plame is feeling on edge. Joe has just published a memoir. Part of the book looks at his service as a diplomat, but he also dives into the controversies that have occupied his and Valerie's lives. He takes aim at President Bush and the war in Iraq. He writes about the leaking of Valerie's identity. And while the book gets plenty of good reviews, right-wing readers and critics take it apart. It's an election year and Bush is running again, so his supporters see the timing of the book as a deliberate roadblock to their candidate's victory, all of which sparks a whole new level of attacks on Plame and Wilson. And some of those attacks are concerning. Plame has been getting sinister letters. She's received alarming phone calls and even death threats. Her four-year-old twins have answered the phone and heard sick, hateful voices on the other end. Joe is away on a national book tour, which leaves Valerie alone in protecting the kids. She can't stop worrying about their safety. When a colleague notifies her of an especially violent threat that's come across her desk, Plame is at the end of her rope. She asks the CIA for 24-7 security at her home in Georgetown until the election is over in November. But she gets a note from the office of the director of security at the agency, and it says they need time to determine the threat level. Two months later, Plame is in her subterranean office, staring at her computer screen, when she gets a call from the director's office. There's a memo waiting for her. She hurries to retrieve it. Finally, she thinks, this is the security she's been waiting for. Now she can sleep at night, knowing she and her family are safe. She grabs the envelope and steps into the hallway to read the memo. It says that after a period of observation, the CIA has found no credible threats to her or her family. Her request has been denied. Flame is shocked. She stares, dumbfounded, at the letter. Agency employees rush by her in the hallway, and the words sink in. She's on her own. Flame walks back to her office and shows the memo to her supervisor. He's as shocked as she is. Stuck for words, he hands the note back to her and mumbles, I imagine you must be disappointed in their decision. Disappointed? Flame doesn't feel disappointed. She feels betrayed. The CIA has always taken pride in protecting its own. After almost two decades of loyal service, Flame feels she certainly qualifies as part of the family. Now the agency is leaving her out in the cold, vulnerable. Flame leaves work and drives home. She turns onto her quiet, tree-lined street, and as she approaches her house, she takes a new point of view. She begins assessing her home from the mindset of an attacker. What are the escape routes? Where are the weak entry points? These are lessons from her CIA training. The minute she walks in the door, she grabs her children's nanny and gives her a quick course in surveillance detection. Plame then issues standing orders to not let the children out of sight. Because even though she's scared, and even though she feels deserted by her government, Valerie Plame is not going to give up. She's not done fighting. It's July 2004. New York Times reporter Judith Miller is traveling to Manhattan to pay a visit to George Freeman. He's the paper's assistant general counsel and respected expert on First Amendment law. Miller makes her way through the buzzing Times building and heads to his office. He greets her with a smile and a firm handshake. Judy, take a seat. What's on your mind? Well, I'm concerned about the government's hunt. They want information about the Valerie Plame leak and Fitzgerald is sending subpoenas to journalists. And what does it have to do with you? Well, I think I'm on the subpoena list. Freeman cocks his head looks at her curiously. I've known for months that Plame worked for the CIA. I had coffee with Scooter Libby, and I've known she was probably behind her husband's fact-finding trip to Niger. Freeman picks up a paperclip and starts twisting it. Uh. So let's start from the start, Judy. Who at the paper did you talk to about this? Only the D.C. bureau chief. I told her that Wilson's wife worked for the CIA and may have been responsible for sending him to Niger. Did anyone follow up? No, Novak scooped us. And did you write anything at all about the allegation? Not a thing. But I can't go before a grand jury and reveal Libby's name. He's a confidential source. 
Freeman leans back in his chair. He grins and flicks the twisted paper clip into the trash. I don't think you have anything to worry about. The paper never wrote about it, and you never wrote about it. So no one's going to send you to jail for something you didn't write. Judith Miller rises, feeling a wave of relief, because like most journalists, she believes it's a sacred duty to keep her sources confidential. And now she's gotten the advice she hoped to hear. She won't have to break that sacred oath. She's been told there's nothing to worry about. It's July 7th, 2004. Joe Wilson comes home in a rage and dumps a two-inch stack of papers on the kitchen table. It's a report from the U.S. Senate Committee that looks at the intelligence agencies and their assessment of Iraq before the war. He hands the sack to Valerie. She does a fast read, and immediately something jumps out. The report says in no uncertain terms that it was Valerie who suggested sending Joe to Niger. And to bolster its claims, the report includes an email from Valerie in which she laid out Joe's qualifications for the investigation. Flame is furious. This is bull, she thinks. First off, the request had come from a higher up who asked her if Joe would meet with the CIA team and discuss a trip, and her supervisor asked her to send that email. She'd completely forgotten about it. It seemed like routine business. This smells like another hit job. The report has been tweaked and distorted and all in an effort to throw her under the bus to once again make the case that Joe's investigation was an act of nepotism, another attempt to discredit them. That night over dinner, Joe is silent, but he's fuming. After a few bites, he gets up and drops his plate in the sink. Plame can sense it. The stress is getting to both of them. Joe turns to Valerie and angrily asks why she wrote that email. Valerie snaps back, saying she wrote the email because her boss asked her to. How was she supposed to know any of this would happen? But there's more of this to come. When the report goes public, the media is all over it. Valerie faces more withering personal attacks. At work, a few days later, a colleague approaches Plame and confirms what she'd remembered all along. Plame didn't suggest Joe for the trip. Her colleague did. And the colleague says he told the truth to the reporting committee. But when he told his supervisor that he wanted to correct the Senate report, the supervisor made it perfectly clear he should remain silent. The administration is suppressing the truth, wanting to hurt her and Joe, she thinks. And it's working. Because Joe's consulting business is now not doing so well, and Plame feels like she's close to a nervous breakdown. Looking for some relief, she requests a six-month leave without pay from the agency. It's August 2004, and New York Times reporter Judith Miller has received a subpoena to appear before the grand jury. She's also ordered to hand over any notes she has from June and July of 2003. The message is clear. Patrick Fitzgerald will pursue anyone who can shed light on the leak that revealed Valerie Plame's identity. Miller's been planning how to deal with this upcoming confrontation, and she's come to a hard decision. She's going to refuse to appear before the grand jury or turn over her notes. She's not going to name her confidential source, and she will not disclose what Scooter Libby told her. In October, Judge Thomas F. Hogan takes a dim view of her stand and sentences Miller to be jailed for up to 18 months. Though in an effort to change her mind, he suspends the sentence until her appeal. But Miller knows that she won't be swayed. It's November 2nd, 2004, the day of the presidential election. This year, George W. Bush is running against Democrat John Kerry. It's been a tough and bitter campaign, and Valerie Plame and Joe Wilson have cast their votes for Kerry, who's vocally criticized Bush's war in Iraq. Plame feels like this could be a day of redemption, a day when everything turns around. She passes through the curtains of the voting booth and casts her vote for Kerry. As she does, she says a silent prayer that he'll defeat the president. After voting, she heads home. Joe heads to a local bar for a cigar and a drink, where he'll watch the election returns come in. While he's there, he gives her a call, practically screaming over the din of the bar. He's excited because the early exit polls are favoring Kerry. She can hear the joy in her husband's voice. Tonight, the two of them have something to be hopeful for, something to look forward to. But Joe's got some other news, too. He just met Judith Miller, who's out on appeal from her jail sentence. Miller recognized him and introduced herself. Joe tells his wife that Miller had said a Kerry win is a done deal. She said that if she thought it was a close call at all, she'd been in the newsroom working. Instead, she spent the afternoon shopping for prison clothes. The two finish chatting, and Plame hangs up, hoping that Miller has the story right. But as the results come in, Plame's heart sinks. President Bush is staying in the White House. While Miller was wrong about the election, she was right to have spent some time thinking about jail. It's July 2005. Judith Miller's appeal doesn't pan out, and she still refuses to reveal her source. So she's sentenced to jail for over two months, or until she agrees to testify. She asks for house arrest, but Patrick Fitzgerald is dismissive. Forced vacation at a comfortable home is not a compelling form of coercion, he says. And she won't be cooling her heels in some country club jailhouse either. With the bang of a gavel, Miller, a 46-year-old investigative reporter, becomes an inmate. As she waves goodbye to her husband in the courtroom, marshals take her by the arms. They shackle her wrists to her ankles, shuffle her into a van, and transport her to a new home, the Alexandria Detention Center in nearby Virginia, a maximum security jail. Miller is photographed and fingerprinted. She's issued an olive green uniform, the word prisoner stenciled in white letters on the back of the jacket. She's led into a 7 by 10 foot cell with an open toilet, a sink, and concrete ledges with yoga mats that serve as bunks. She'll share the space with two other women. The fluorescent overhead lights are kept on all day and night. There's no exercise yard, but female inmates are allowed to use the basketball court when the male prisoners aren't shooting hoops. But for Miller, the worst thing is the loss of control and the sheer boredom. On her first day, another inmate approaches her and says they've met before. Miller asks where, and the inmate says it was the White House Correspondents' Dinner in 1988. 
The woman was a former Capitol Hill worker who'd been locked up for writing bad checks. Even in prison, Miller thinks, you still network with Capitol Hill staffers. Soon, Miller discovers that the word is out on her, but in a good way. Miller is in jail because she's not a snitch. In the world behind bars, that gains her respect. And as the weeks pass, she learns to tolerate her daily life at the jail. But her stay could go on much longer. Patrick Fitzgerald is threatening to extend her confinement by 18 months if she won't reveal her source. So Miller decides to take action. She authorizes her lawyers to contact Scooter Libby. She wants to see if he'll give her a waiver, allowing her to reveal his name. The lawyers come back with an answer. Libby says yes. She should be happy, but she's also skeptical. She wants to know whether Libby was somehow coerced. Soon she gets a strange letter from him. In it he writes, I believed a year ago, as now, that testimony by all will benefit all. The public report of every other reporter's testimony makes clear they did not discuss Miss Plame's name or identity with me. Miller doesn't know what that means. She knows Libby discussed Plame with her at a breakfast in 2003, and her notebooks back that up. Was he pushing her to lie? Whatever Libby's motive may have been, soon Miller makes a deal with Fitzgerald. He'll only ask about Libby, not other sources, and she won't have to give up her notebooks. On September 29th, after 85 days in jail, Miller is set free. The next day, she testifies and reveals her interactions with Libby. She's vague on certain details, and her memory is faulty, but she confirms a key point for Fitzgerald. She talked with Scooter Libby about Valerie Plame. This testimony brings the investigation closer to the White House, closer to the leaders who leaked Valerie Plame's name, closer to the ones who sought to pay back her husband for criticizing the war. Next on American Scandal, Patrick Fitzgerald's investigation into the Plame leak is firing on all cylinders. Now, it's homing in on Scooter Libby. Whether he'll take a bullet for his boss, Vice President Dick Cheney, remains to be seen. But someone is going down. From Wondery, this is American Scandal. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I have two other podcasts you may enjoy. American History Tellers and American Elections Wicked Game. Search for them and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening right now. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. By supporting them, you help us offer this show to you for free. We'd also like to learn a little bit about you. Please complete a short survey at Wondery.com slash survey. That's Wondery.com slash survey. We'd love to learn what you're listening to, what you like, and what topics we might tackle next. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. We use many sources when researching our stories, but we highly recommend Fair Game by Valerie Plame, Politics of Truth by Joseph Wilson, and Hubris, the inside story of spin, scandal, and the selling of the Iraq War by Michael Isakoff and David Korn. And just a quick note about our reenactments. We can't always know exactly what was said, but everything in our show is based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. The sound designed by Derek Barons. This episode is written by Peter Gilstrap. Our senior editor is Karen Lowe. Produced by Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.